subscribe to our YouTube channel and press the bell icon to get the latest updates. Well, good afternoon, uh, everyone. Let me welcome all of you to the ICS special lecture by Ambassador Sun Wei Tung on the theme of India-China relations: the way forward, which is being hosted by the Institute of Chinese Studies. Uh, uh, we have the print as a media partner. We are live streaming this event on our YouTube channel. It's really good to see a very large number of friends present in the meeting room and following us on the YouTube. Welcome once again to all of you. And let me extend a especially warm welcome to a speaker, Ambassador Sun Wei Tung, Ambassador of the People's Republic of China to India. Thank you, Ambassador, for joining us. Ambassador Sun, as you know, is a seasoned diplomat and an old India hand in the Chinese diplomatic service. Uh, I have known him for a long time. In fact, I first engaged with him when he was political counselor in the Chinese embassy in New Delhi some 15 years ago. He was subsequently deputy head of the Asia department in the Chinese Ministry of Foreign Affairs in Beijing, the ambassador of China to Pakistan and head of the policy planning department at the foreign office. He has been the ambassador of China to India since last year. He brings to his assignment vast experience and deep understanding of India, which is required in ample measure at a time when India-China relationship is passing through one of its most difficult and challenging periods. This afternoon, Ambassador Sun will share with us his perspectives on the current dynamics and future trajectory of India-China engagement, which is poised at a perilous juncture in the aftermath of the recent border incidents and the Galwan clash of 15 June. Let me, however, point out that even before these incidents have caused a sharp downturn in ties, India-China relations were under stress. With his deep knowledge of India, Ambassador is no doubt aware of the profound anxiety, and if I may so, even anger on the Indian side about recent developments. He's also aware that there is a serious talk here that India-China relations are at a turning point even experienced Indian diplomats who are deeply invested in this relationship are speaking of the need for reset in ties. Over the past three decades, uh, friends, as you know, India and China have followed the policy of compartmentalizing the boundary question and other outstanding issues and agreeing not to let them come in the way of development of their relations. It is clear that this policy has now run its course. Differences have turned into contentious discord and are adversely impacting the relationship. There's no wishing away this reality. If India-China relations have to resume on a positive trajectory, we have to make progress on accumulated issues and irritants. Just managing them would not do any longer. An urgent requirement is the restoration of the status quo ante in the border areas prior to the recent unfortunate developments it's also imperative that we clarify and confirm the line of actual control and move towards a common understanding of the LAC in keeping with formal agreements reached by the two countries in the past. And both Ambassador Sun and I have been involved with these agreements, which were concluded earlier. I hope that his remarks, Ambassador Sun, will look at the root causes of the current predicament in our relations and suggest a way out. It cannot be business as usual, I'm afraid. We look forward to hearing you, Ambassador Sun. Uh, Ambassador Sun will speak for about 30 minutes. Thereafter, he has agreed to take questions. I'm sure there'll be a lot of questions. Uh, you may indicate your interest in asking questions by using the raise hand option available at the bottom of the list of participants. Questions can also be sent to me through the chat option. I'll now invite Ambassador Soon to make his remarks. Ambassador, welcome once again. Thank you. Uh, dear Ambassador Ashok Khan, and uh, dear experts and uh, colleagues, uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, Indian friends, namaskar and uh, good afternoon. Uh, it is my honor to attend this uh, webinar on China-India relations held by the Institute of Chinese Studies. First of all, I would like to express my sincere uh, appreciation 
to uh, Mr. Ashok Kanta and ICS for your efforts to in holding this uh, webinar. Uh, I can see some of my friends were also on the line and uh, Mr. Vijay Nambia, the former ambassador uh, and other friends. It's such a pleasure to see you again. And uh, many of you were well-known experts on China, uh, like Ambassador Kanta and uh, Ambassador Nambia. You have made a lot of uh, contributions to the development of China-India relations over the years. And today we are gathered online to have constructive discussions on how to move China-India relations forward. And uh, such discussions are necessary under the current situation. So I'm glad to take this opportunity to share my thoughts on the future of China-India relations under the topic of implement the consensus reached by the leaders of China-India to bring China-India relations back to the track of sound and steady development. And before looking into the future, uh, I think it's necessary to look into the past of China-India relations. Well, this year marks the 70th anniversary of the establishment of diplomatic ties between China and India. And in the past 70 years, we witnessed an extraordinary journey with the joint efforts of both sides the two countries have established a strategic and cooperative partnership for peace and prosperity. Especially in recent years, President Xi Jinping and Prime Minister Narendra Modi held two informal summits and reached important consensus. They emphasized that China and India are each other's development opportunities and stable factors in the current international landscape. We need to strengthen the closer developmental partnership between our two countries. So under the guidance of the consensus reached by the, the two leaders, China and India have deepened exchanges and cooperation in various fields. Our coordination in major international and regional affairs has been continuously enhanced. And although there are existing differences between us, the two sides have always been seeking solutions through dialogue and consultation. China-India relations have never stopped moving forward. And along the way, the precious experience we have learned is that we should unswervingly adhere to the strategic guidance of our leaders, achieve common development through friendly cooperation and properly handle differences through dialogue and consultation to push forward the sound development of our bilateral relations. I think these lessons and experiences still have imp important practical significance in handling China-India relations even today. Recently, as Ambassador Kanter just mentioned, there occurred the Garvan Valley incident in the Western sector of the China-India boundary. It was an unfortunate incident. Neither side wants to see it happen. 
And immediately after the incident, the two sides conducted dialogues through military and diplomatic channels. The Chinese state counselor and foreign minister Wang Yi held telephone conversations with Indian external affairs minister, Dr. Jay Shanka, and the national security advisor, Mr. Ajit Doba, respectively. The two sides also held four rounds of COPS commander level talks and three meetings under the working mechanism for consultation and coordination on China-India border affairs. It's the WMCC. And with the joint efforts of both sides, the border troops have disengaged in most localities. The situation on the ground is de-escalating and the temperature is coming down. I have noticed that for some time, uh, scholars from Indian think tanks have paid close attention to the Galvan Valley incident and expressed uh, various opinions. And uh, some believe that this will be a turning point to change or even uh, reverse China-India relations. But honestly speaking, I can share with you my idea that is different uh, with this view. Uh, in my video speech on July the 10th, I proposed five points. China and India should be partners rather than rivals. China and India need peace rather than confrontation. We need to pursue win-win cooperation rather than zero-sum game. And we need to build trust rather than suspicion. China-India relations should move forward rather than backward. I think that position is very clear and it is uh, different with the points that uh, uh, China and India is at a turning point. In the recent and current era, we believe that the basic national conditions of China and India as, as the two largest developing neighbors remains unchanged. The orientation of China and India being partners, friendly cooperation and common development remains unchanged. The general structure that China and India cannot live without each other remains unchanged. So these three unchanged are our basic judgment on the current China-India relations. And it is based on this judgment that China's basic policy towards India remains unchanged. Both sides should grasp the fundamental interest of the two countries and their peoples and stick to friendly cooperation and properly handle differences to bring the bilateral relations back to the normal track. And to move China-India relations forward, I believe that we need to strengthen our views on several key issues. The first, China is committed to peaceful development and it is not a threat or strategic threat to India. 
To safeguard world peace and promote common development has always been the fundamental goal of China's diplomacy. The Chinese people believe in peace and harmony and value sincerity and integrity. So there is no genie for seeking hegemony or resorting to military power in Chinese people's blood. China has a long history as the most powerful country in the world, but it never colonized other countries. Since the founding of the People's Republic of China over 70 years ago, we have always pursued good neighborly friendship sought development with our neighbors and worked to make the pie of cooperation bigger. And no matter how developed China may become, we will follow the path of peaceful development and will never seek hegemony or expansion. It has been formally written into China's constitution and it is our basic national policy and solemn commitment. There are nearly 1.4 billion people in China, and it is an arduous task to lift such a huge population out of poverty and make them lead a happy life. Since the founding of the People's Republic of China, we have, top prior, we have given top priority to development for ensuring ad adequate food and clothing for the people to build a basically moderate prosperous society. We will soon complete the building of a moderately prosperous society in all respects. And peace is a prerequisite for development. There is no development without peace. And to achieve high quality development, China must uphold and safeguard peace. And as the two largest developing countries, emerging economies, and the two only two countries with over 1 billion population in the world, China and India are both at a critical period of national development and rejuvenation. And both countries need to concentrate on their own development and achieve revitalization. This is not something that can be accomplished overnight. It is a historic mission that will take one decade or more decades or even longer to achieve. Therefore, the dragon elephant tango is the only correct choice for the two sides. It best serves the fundamental interests of the two countries and the peoples and serves the lasting peace and the prosperity of Asia and the world at large. And it is based on this consensus that previ previous generations of Chinese and Indian leaders have always viewed China-India relations from a strategic perspective and put boundary question and other issues left over from history in an appropriate position of China-India relations to properly handle and manage them and to avoid complications and escalation and to prevent them affecting the overall development of China-India relations. We still can remember that in 1988, former India Prime Minister Rajiv Gandhi made an ice-breaking trip to 
to China. And the then Chinese leader, Mr. Deng Xiaoping, made it clear to him that development is the common task facing the two countries. When China, only when China and India have developed, will a real Asian century emerge, he said. And he also said, if China and India are developed, we our contributions to the mankind. And the two sides also agreed to actively develop bilateral relations in other areas while seeking a mutually acceptable solution to the boundary question. And it laid the foundation for the rapid development of China-India relations over the next more than three decades. And since 2014, President Xi Jinping and the Prime Minister Narendra Modi have stressed on many occasions that China and India are each other's opportunities and pose no threat to each other. This has made a basic judgment on China-India relations and pointed out the right direction for the development of bilateral relations. And at present, both China and India are facing severe challenges, namely COVID-19, the economic downturn, and pressure on people's livelihoods and employment caused by the epidemic. When I saw the people wearing masks on the streets and the doctors and nurses in protective suits, I really feel that the, the invisible virus, rather than China, is the threat facing India. And in the face of this common enemy, China and India should work together to overcome difficulties. It is undoubted, undoubtedly short-sighted and uh, harmful to deny the long history of peaceful coexistence between China and India and to portray our friendly neighbor for thousands of years as an opponent or a strategic threat due to the temporary differences and difficulties. We should correctly analyze, analyze and uh, view each other's strategic intentions and prevent misinterpretation and miscalculation in a positive, open, and inclusive attitude. Second point is that China firmly upholds its sovereignty, and meanwhile, China will never engage in aggression or expansion. The rights and wrongs of the Garvan Valley incident are very clear. I have talked about it in my previous interview with Indian media, so I won't go into the details today. What I want to say is that how the two sides should treat us, treat this. It is the legitimate right for every country to safeguard its own sovereignty and territory integrity. And since the founding of the PRC, China has firmly safeguarded its national sovereignty, security, and development interests, and opposed all forms of hegemonism and power politics. And in meanwhile, we have never been aggressive or pursued our own development at the expense of other countries. 
up till now, China has demarcated boundary with 12 of its 14 land neighbors through friendly negotiations, turning the land borders into bonds of friendly cooperation. This demonstrates that on the basis of mutual respect and treating each other as equals, we can find the right way to solve problems through peaceful negotiations. One fact that is that China has never claimed any land outside its own territory. The level of expansionists cannot be pinned on China. It is normal for neighbors to have differences. We should focus on friendship and cooperation instead of only on differences. And we should not allow the development process of the two countries and the overall interests of the bilateral relations to be disturbed. As we Chinese often say, you can't see the wood for the trees. The more challenges we face on the boundary question, the more we need to strengthen dialogue and communication. And pending the final settlement of the boundary question, two sides should make joint efforts to maintain peace and tranquility in the border areas. Over the past decades, the two sides have managed differences through dialogues and negotiation and established various mechanisms, such as the special representatives meeting on the boundary question, reached a series of agreements to maintain peace and tranquility in the border areas, and keep the channels of military and diplomatic communication open. These good practices must continue. There have been an argument in the Indian public opinion on the boundary question, which worries me. And that's suggesting that the India government adjust its policy towards India, uh, towards China, and change its stance on issues related to Taiwan, Xizang, Hong Kong, and South China Sea to put pressure on China. I want to point out emphatically that Taiwan, Hong Kong, Xizang, and Xinjiang affairs are totally China's internal affairs and bear on China's sovereignty and security. While China doesn't interfere into other countries' domestic affairs, it allows no external interference and never trades its core interests either. As the two countries have different histories, cultural backgrounds, and social systems, it is inevitable that we have different views on some issues. President Xi Jinping pointed out that mutual trust is the fundamental, is the foundation for the stability and the development of China-India relations. And this speaks to the essence and the key of China-India relations. To achieve mutual trust between China and India, we need to have a correct understanding of each other's strategic intentions and strengthen communication and exchanges. We need to respect each other, treat each other as equals, and be open and inclusive. We must adhere to the principle of non-interference in each other's internal affairs, and respect and accommodate each other's core interests and major concerns. We need to honor our commitments, walk the talk, 
and implement the consensus reached between the two sides. Both China and India are the great oriental nations with ancient civilizations. I have the full confidence that we have enough wisdom and capability to solve the problems between us and blaze a new path of peaceful coexistence and win-win cooperation between major neighboring countries. And the third point is, China advocates win-win cooperation and opposes zero-sum game. China has always emphasized win-win cooperation in its, its development. While developing itself rapidly, China has contributed more than 30% to world economic growth and over 70% to the global poverty reduction for many years in a row. China never exported refugees, let alone wars. Instead, China has shared its development dividends with others. China's contribution to the world are obvious to all. And that is why President Xi Jinping advocated that we should build a shared future for human beings. Chinese and Indian economies are highly complementary and uh, have huge market potential. Our bilateral economic and trade relations are a model of win-win cooperation, which has been proved by many facts. Since the 21st century, bilateral trade volume between China and India has increased by 32 times to nearly 100 billion US dollars last year. China has been India's largest trading partner for many years with a cumulative investment of more than 8 billion US dollars in India. China-India economic trade cooperation has boosted the development of industries such as mobile phones, household appliance, infrastructure, automobile making, medicine and biology in India, creating a large number of local jobs and cost-effective products for Indian consumers. If it is not for the high degree of complementarity between China and India, how can we explain the remarkable achievements of China-India economic and trade cooperation in the past decades? And in fact, China, in Chinese and Indian economies are interwoven and interdependent. According to local statistics in India, in 2018 and 19, 92% of Indian computers, 82% of TV sets, 80% of optical fibers, 85% of motorcycle components are imported from China. Countless examples like these are the reflection of globalization. And globalization has deepened the interconnection between countries into capillaries. Whether you want it or not, the trend is difficult to reverse. Both China and India have been deeply embedded in the global industrial chain and supply chain. The development of economic and trade cooperation between our two countries is determined by international division of labor. It is also the, nature cho the natural choice of enterprises and consumers 
for our two countries under the market-oriented principles. The forced decoupling of the Chinese and Indian economies is against the trend and will only lead to a lose-lose outcome. A German friend working in India recently told me that Due to India's recent restrictions on the import of Chinese auto components, the production of German automakers in India had been greatly affected. This fully demonstrates that self-protection, non-tariff barriers, and restrictive measures violate market laws and WTO rules. It will only be harmful to oneself, to others, and as well as to the world. The economic and trade exchanges between China and India should be a positive cycle of mutual accomplishment. It should not be become a knockout nor a zero-sum game that deliberately suppresses others. Indian government announced that it will provide a favorable investment environment for foreign companies, which should include Chinese companies and treat e each and everyone equally. Both sides should recognize the mutually beneficial and win-win nature of bilateral economic and trade cooperation, jointly create an open, fair, just business environment and maintain the momentum of China-India economic and trade cooperation to bring more tangible benefits to the peoples. Ladies and gentlemen, China-India relations today are hard-earned and should be cherished all the more. It is like an exquisite, exquisite craft glass. So much effort and uh, wisdom by a lot of people are needed to make this glass. Some of the Chinese experts online today have also put a lot of efforts into this. But it will only take a few seconds to break it. China-India relations have reached a critical juncture now, and a little carelessness may risk breaking the glass. At this moment, the two sides should handle the relations cautiously, calmly, and rationally, confirm to the international trend, and always look forward and move forward and resolutely avoid whirlpool of suspicion and confrontation caused by miscalculation of the situation. Personally, I always have strong confidence in the future of China-India relations. China-India friendship serves the fundamental interests of the two countries. It accords with the aspiration of the two peoples and the general trend. It should not be stagnated or even reversed due to temporary difficulties. As an old Chinese saying goes, bite the green mountain like the bamboo and won't let go, no matter from whichever direction the winds leap. And Mahatma Gandhi once said, find purpose, the means will follow. As long as China and India have firm faith in developing good neighborly and friendly relations, transmit the strategic sense consensus reached by the leaders, and resort to actions, 
no force can shake it. Dear friends, you come from strategic, academic, and uh, media circles, and uh, you are the opinion leaders of Indian society. I hope that you can speak with an objective, rational, and responsible voice, and meet China halfway, and correctly guide and shape the Indian public opinions on China and inject more positive energy into China in their relations. The Chinese embassy in India is willing to work together with you and let's transmit and implement the consensus reached by the two leaders and contribute to bring China-India relations back to the track of steady and sound development at an earliest time. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ambassador. Thank you for uh, your remarks. Uh, you know, Ambassador Sun has acknowledged that India-China relations are at a critical juncture, but he doesn't agree that uh, the relations are poised at a turning point. Uh, he has uh, not surprisingly you know, given an optimistic uh, and relatively upbeat uh, uh, picture of the future of this relationship. Uh, he believes that uh, India and China continue to be opportunities for its, each other rather than being threat, and that China is not a strategic threat to India. Thanks, Ambassador, for your remarks. Uh, uh, as you can uh, well imagine, uh, there are a very large number of questions uh, uh, in fact, I'm not sure we will to do justice to everyone who wishes to pose questions today. So let me begin with uh, our media partner, The Print. Uh, Jyoti Malhotra, uh, National Strategic Affairs Editor of Print, will pose the first couple of questions. Jyoti. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Ambassador Kantha. Thank you for this opportunity. Ambassador Sun, it's um, lovely to see you. I think we first met at the Herat Security Dialogue when you were Ambassador to Pakistan. So it's um, lovely to see you here in Delhi. And I especially liked your comparison to the India-China relationship as a piece of glass, which is so, so delicate that it's going to break any time. But my first question to you is about the 15th of June, the night of 15th of June in Ladakh, when Indian and Chinese soldiers had this very brutal clash. And we know that 20 Indian soldiers were killed in that clash. We also know that the Chinese commanding officer, just like the Indian commanding officer, was also killed. But we don't know how many Chinese soldiers were killed. And since you are an ancient civilization, you are a big power, uh, I'm sure you won't hide the number. And I'm sure you will tell me and tell all of us today how many Chinese soldiers were killed in that clash on the night of 15th of June. Um, well, I, as I said, that uh, the uh, right and wrong of the Galavan Valley incident uh, is very clear. And uh, I must uh, uh, make it very clear that the responsibility is not on the Chinese side. Um, even since uh, April this year, that uh, the foreign troops, uh, uh, the uh, Indian uh, frontline troops were keep making uh, roads and bridges and infrastructures like that along the Galavan Valley. Uh, and uh, I think that also uh, leads to the representations from the Chinese side through military and uh, diplomatic channels. And after these rep representations, the Indian side agreed to uh, withdraw its uh, people and uh, uh, dismantle the infrastructure, which was across the LAC. And there was a meeting between the COP commanders on the 6th of June and the Indian side have committed that they will not go, went across the watermouth of Galvan Valley to patrol or to uh, 
raise up any infrastructure. But unfortunately, on the evening of uh, the 15th of June, the Indian foreign, uh, the Indian frontline troops have break, broke this uh, uh, consensus that reached by the Corps commanders meeting, and they went across the RAC again, and they even violently attacked the Chinese uh, uh, soldiers who are coming up to make representations. And that leads to a very harsh clash or a physical clash between the two sides. And that leads to casualties. Well, I think uh, um, these, this is the, the reason that this incident happened. And I said that uh, this is a situation that no one wants to see. It's an unfortunate incident. Uh, but we found that uh, here we, we have many uh, uh, interpretations on how, why China has not allowed, announced the casualties from the Chinese side. I think those interpretations is not helpful to ease the situation in the border areas. And uh, what we are now doing is to making efforts, joint, joint efforts, to de-escalate the situation and ease the tension along the border areas. So that's why we hope that uh, the Indian side could understand the good wellness from the Chinese side uh, not to uh, uh, make the uh, contradiction uh, even more higher and uh, also try to maintain the peace and the tranquility along the border areas. So we hope that you can understand the goodwill from the Chinese side that we don't want to add more tensions and uh, escalate the situation uh, in the Gala Valley and along the border areas. Thank you. Uh, Ambassador, I have another question, which is, um, I mean, you didn't answer my question about the number of Chinese casualties. And like I said, India has nothing to hide. We told you, we told the world that we had 20 Indian soldiers uh, including a commanding officer who died. But anyway, maybe you don't want to answer it. But my other question is about um, areas like the Galwan Valley. Why is it that China keeps intruding into Indian territory? There is a line of actual control. Why is it that Chinese troops do not stay on their own side of the line of actual control? And this, by the way, is a question uh, which is uh, my colleague Naini Mabasu and me are asking this question. Why is it that, uh, th and this is not the first time that you have included across the LAC. This happened in 2013 in Depsang. It happened again when um, Chinese President Xi Jinping was in India. Uh, it happening, and it's happening now again. So this is the third time in the last four years that Chinese troops have violated the line of actual control come across it into Indian territory, into the Galvan Valley, into the Pangong So. Why do you keep doing that? And you're right now you're at the Pangong So. When, when are you going back? Well, I think that uh, China and India has um, uh, signed uh, a number of uh, agreements and uh, protocols for the uh, troops to uh, uh, abide by those rules. And clearly, the Chinese troops, uh, they always patrol uh, in the Chinese side and uh, not across the line of actual control. I think that is very clear that uh, uh, the right and wrong for these incidents or frictions along the line of actual control 
it's very clear that uh, we found that it is the, the Indian side that uh, first went across the line, provoked and also violently attacked Chinese officers and soldiers. For example, in the Galavan Valley, that uh, when they were going to negotiate, that leads to a violent uh, attack. And that also leads to the uh, intense physical clashes between the two sides. And the Chinese troops always exercise self-restraint and take all the necessary steps to avoid an escalation of the situation. But uh, having said that, we have to also react properly and defend ourselves. So I think the line of actual control is clear and uh, the Chinese troops in the front line they also know and they patrol in those areas for many years. And we also abide by those agreements we have signed and also follow those protocols. But we hope that two sides can work together to keep peace and tranquility along the border areas. Thank you. Thank you, Ambassador. Uh, we are fortunate to have with us uh, in the meeting room just now uh, four former ambassadors of India to China. You know, Ambassador Vijay Nambiar, you know, Ambassador uh, Nirupma, Chanshekar Das Gupta, Ambassador Nirupma Rao, and Ambassador Vijay Gokhale. So let me welcome all of them. Uh, two of them would like to ask questions to you, Ambassador Vijay Nambiar and Ambassador Nirupma Rao. May I first invite Ambassador Nambiar to pose his question? Uh, I hope I'm. I can be heard now. Yes, yes. Yes, you are audible. Uh, yeah. Good evening, Ambassador Sun. Uh, I think uh, my the question I had in mind has actually been addressed by you, but I'm afraid I still did do find a little difficulty in getting a clear understanding of what you mean. I was talking of trust. This the trust between the two countries have received, I think, almost an irreparable blow after the latest incidents. Now you do say that. One of the major needs, one of the five points you mentioned was the question of trust. You talk about win-win and you talk about the LAC was very clear. But I understand that on all these three things, the understanding of what that trust implies between the Chinese side and the Indian side is completely different. Even the implication of win-win appears to be different from what we conceive and what you conceive. The LAC, uh, it's clear that there are different interpretations, but you, there has not been any agreement on by the Chinese side on even identifying the LAC or the map whenever such a question has been raised. How can you expect the building of trust, the uh, kind of proceeding forward on win-win, and uh, respect for the LAC if this basic requirement of commonality of perception is not there? Thank you. Well, thank you, Excellency. Um, I think you're, uh, you're talking about uh, uh, three, three different things. Uh, one is about the win-win cooperation. Uh, the second is about uh, LAC itself. Yes. Right. And uh, the third is uh, uh, about... Uh, trust. Trust. Building trust. Yes. Well, I think uh, for the win-win uh, uh, cooperation, that is very clear that uh, China always pursues such a uh, cooperation. And uh, we believe that uh, China and India as two big developing countries, we have all the complementarities and the potential to cooperate with, with each other. And that kind of cooperation is a win-win 
cooperation, and that will lead to a mutual beneficial result between us. So in the past decades, we have conducted so close cooperation with each other and the peoples of our two countries, which means that the two thirds of the whole population in the world benefited from this cooperation. And I have, I can see no reason why we should not continue such a win-win cooperation in the future. Now about the um, mutual trust, yes, I believe so that uh, the uh, mutual trust and confidence is the basis or foundation for our bilateral relations. And uh, uh, as uh, um, the President Xi Jinping has said that if we need to move ahead and move forward, the uh, mutual trust is the foundation. So I think that we need to have more communications and contact with each other, share our views and exchange our opinions and uh, seek convergence while if there are differences, we can uh, sought for uh, a solution or we can keep on discussing on it, but do not let these uh, differences to become disputes. And also I think uh, in the past years, we have established so many mechanisms between China and India, uh, like the uh, uh, special representatives uh, mechanism, like the high level cultural and the people to people exchange mechanism, and uh, above that is the informal summit that we have held two times in the past two years. I think under the leadership and the guidance of our leaders, we know that China and India are uh, two developing countries and we have such an important task for future development. And that means China and India should focus on our work on development and uh, with cooperation, with contacts, with exchange of visits and communications, and with the discussion of all these mechanisms, China and India can further build up a stronger mutual confidence with each other. And about the uh, uh, LAC or the uh, uh, peace and tranquility along the border areas, as I have already said that uh, this uh, issue is left over by history. And uh, we have already agreed that this issue should be solved through peaceful negotiations for a solution which is mutually acceptable for both sides. And before we can find a solution, we must work together to keep peace and tranquility along the border areas. And that, that's why we need to also uh, uh, have such uh, contacts like in different levels, like the Cope Commanders meeting and WMCC. And the, those meetings also give us a chance to also have exchange of views and discuss how to maintain peace and tranquility around the border area, especially after this incident that happened, we need to disengage and, dis, uh, and de-escalate the situation in the border areas. I think that also helps us to build up our mutual confidence. And uh, when we build up this confidence, it is also basic for us to move ahead for the uh, further cooperation uh, of our bilateral relations. Thank you, Ambassador. Uh, may I now invite Ambassador Nirupma Rao to pose a question to Ambassador Sun. Nirupma? Nirupma, you can ask your question.
Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay. Uh, Ambassador Sun, uh, recently some Chinese analysts who have some knowledge of opinions expressed within the Chinese government have said that, and I quote, China needs to stand up to India, whatever the cost, unquote. And further, I quote again, China is pushing for territory occupied in the 1962 war as a reaction to perceived Indian exploitation of China's vulnerability due to COVID-19 and China's deteriorating relations with the United States, unquote. If this is true, Ambassador, it would suggest that we are looking at a long-term situation of instability in our border areas. What is your view? Thank you. Uh, Excellency, may I also uh, uh, seek for more information about uh, what you have quoted? Uh, is that an uh, article by Chinese government? No, no, it's not an article by Chinese government. It's an article by a Chinese uh, analyst uh, who's currently with the Stimson Center, but she is from, from China, from the PRC. Her name is Yun Sun, and uh, she had recently written an article that received a lot of attention uh, when soon after we had the Galvan clash. Well, I think uh, this article doesn't uh, represent China's uh, official position. That is for sure. Uh, as we see it, we don't believe that uh, China and India should come into a clash uh, in, the, in the future, as I strongly believe that the two countries have a bright future of further development between our two countries and also make our own contribution to the global prosperity and peace. So I think that uh, uh, China and India should not um, depart from each other, but should come together even closer. And uh, uh, when I talk about our practical cooperation, uh, I think there are also huge space for our cooperation in the future, especially in trade and investment, and also people to people contact. And we are also talking about uh, the leaders consensus I think that is uh, clear enough to say that uh, China and India are both opportunities to each other rather than threats. And uh, China-India relations provide uh, the factor of stability to the world that the world will also benefit from such a stable and uh, continuous relations with each other. So I think now the problem is not that uh, we have talked too much about uh, our leaders' consensus. The problem is not that uh, it's not enough to, to be mentioned um, in different cases. And uh, I think that uh, it is necessary for us to reiterate all these uh, uh, consensus and uh, transmit and implement it on the ground to let more people know about these important consensus and ask, ask the people to also uh, think in a positive way to uh, implement these consensus. Only by doing so that China and India relations can achieve a stable and steady uh, move that forward and benefit uh, the peoples. Well, we are two great civilizations. As we are talking about our histories, it's more than 2,000 years of contacts. And we can clearly remember those uh, pioneers like uh, Xuanzang and uh, Bodhidharma. But nowadays, uh, China and India are coming more closer because there are modern technologies that can bring us closer together. And uh, at this moment, we need more heart-to-heart uh, -heart contacts with each other uh, rather than suspicions. And we also need to have uh, more communications through those bi dialogues and mechanisms so that we can have a better understanding with each other's strategic intentions. I strongly believe that uh, 
China and India as the two big uh, uh, emerging economies, um, we must pursue an independent uh, foreign policy and also strategic autonomy that uh, we must decide our policies based on our own common interests and also the interests of the people in this region, for example, in Asia, in South Asia, East Asia. And uh, these uh, interests related to billions of people. And uh, we must uh, play our responsible role for the prosperity and the stability in the region. I think that is the correct way for us to move ahead. And thank you very much, Ambassador. Thank you, Ambassador. We have several journalists present with us. So, uh, I should uh, give opportunity to at least a couple of them to ask their questions. Uh, uh, may I invite uh, Mr. Anand Krishnan of Hindu? He has some questions for you. One question, Anand. Uh, sure. Uh, thank you, Ambassador Kanta, and thank you, uh, Ambassador Sun. Uh, I have a question on the line of actual control again. Um, in the Galwan Valley, China and India said there was previously no dispute on the LAC in the valley, uh, but India has indicated that China describing the LAC as running at the estuary or the bend in the river was a new claim and this was beyond China's 1960 claim. So I was just wondering, can you share your thoughts on that? And more broadly, do you think this summer's events will prompt a rethink in Beijing on taking forward the clarification process? Process has not gone forward since 2002. Thank you very much. Oh, thank you. Uh, well, it's always a pleasure to see you. Uh, I think we have met quite some times, and thanks for the question. Uh, well, I think on the uh, northern bank of uh, Bangun Lake, uh, China's traditional cus customary boundary line uh, is in accordance with the LAC. And uh, there's no such case as China has expanded its territory claim. Uh, China hopes that uh, the Indian border troops will strictly abide by the relevant bilateral agreements and uh, protocols between the two countries and refrain from uh, uh, illegally crossing the RAC to the Chinese side. This is... Uh, uh, about the, uh, the uh, question that you have raised just now. And also I may say that the original purpose for clarification of LAC uh, is to maintain peace and tranquility in the border areas. But however, if one side unilaterally delimits uh, the LAC as per its own understanding during the negotiations. And that could create some new disputes and that will be a departure from the original purpose for clarify, uh, clarification of the LAC. So we hope that uh, the Indian side could work with the Chinese side uh, in the same direction and uh, continue to push forward negotiations on the settlement of frame, uh, the settlement framework in accordance with the political parameters or guiding principles for settlement of China-India boundary questions reached in 2005 and strive to find a fair, reasonable and uh, mutually acceptable solution while implementing confidence building measures and maintaining peace and tranquility uh, in the border areas. Thank you, Anna. Thank you. Uh, can I now invite uh, Devirupa Mitra to ask a question? Devirupa? Ambassador, thank you for the opportunity to ask a question. Uh, I want to again uh, ask, uh, basically we asked the same question that Mr. Khan had also mentioned in his opening speech. And uh, what our, Mr. Krishnan uh, just now asked, why uh, you, you right now mentioned that the LAC uh, clarification on the exterior maps was because it could lead to another dispute. Can you, we have already done an exchange of map in one sector. So why can't we do it in other sectors? And 
uh, won't it basically elevate the situation? In fact, it, we knew each other's perception and the perception of the LAC. Thank you. Uh, as I just said, that uh, the uh, uh, the purpose for clarification of LAC is to maintain peace and tranquility along the border areas. And uh, um, when we look back into the history, we will find that uh, uh, if one side has unilaterally put its own perception on the LAC uh, during the negotiations, that will create new disputes. And that's why uh, this um, process cannot be moved on. And uh, I think that is a departure for the original purpose to clarify the RAC. Of course, before we can solve this uh, problem, we need to maintain peace and tranquility along the border areas. So I think that it is necessary for us to follow the uh, agreements and the protocols we have reached in the past and also sincerely uh, implement those we have agreed in the agreements and the protocols. I think we have the uh, 1993 and 1996 agreements on the uh, peace and tranquility and also confidence building measures and also other agreements and protocols that also clearly give us the guidance and code of conduct for uh, uh, dealing with those uh, incidents that may happen in the border areas. So the important thing is that we must uh, follow those uh, agreements and also continue our uh, discussion and consultations between the, uh, uh, along the, the diplomatic channels and also between the COPE commanders so that we can uh, also uh, find out the way to uh, de-escalate the situation and also uh, restore the peace and tranquility in the border areas. That is my uh, answer. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, can I now invite you know, Ambassador Vishnu Prakash? He wishes to ask a question, he raised his hand. Vishnu? Thank you, Chair. Uh, greetings, Ambassador. I have a very simple question. In Can you audience. speak a bit loudly? We can't hear you. Am I audible now? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. All right. Ambassador, uh, greetings. Uh, in your video message, which you had posted on the embassy website, you had said we are neither a warlike state nor an assertive country. Today, you have said the same thing. Also, Foreign Minister Wang Yi had stated, and I quote, aggression and expansion are never in the genes of the Chinese nation throughout its 5,000 years of history. So here I'm quoting Chinese dignitaries like yourself. Ambassador, the problem is that uh, barring a couple of countries, uh, unfortunately for, or fortunately, nobody in the world uh, believes these assertions. The world believes otherwise. My question is, why is China so misunderstood? Is it that the Committee of Nations is ignorant or biased? Uh, can I have your comments, please? Hmm. Well, I think that uh, um, if it is a truth, um, it will always be a truth. But if it is a line, if even if it has been repeated a thousand times, it's still a line. And if you look back into the history, when China, as I said, once was uh, the strongest maybe country in the world, you cannot find a history of colonialize or invasion. But, but just uh, friendly contact with other countries. So when we are talking about the, uh, uh, this uh, uh, sovereignty and territory integrity, every country has the right to protect its sovereignty and territory, integrity. Uh, 
I think that this is uh, a pretty natural thing. And uh, when we are talking about uh, China's development, in the past decades, you can find that China always followed a peaceful development. And uh, this perhaps is the rare or even only example for the major countries like China, with more than 1 billion people, have achieved such economic growth in the past 40 years and become the second largest economy. But our achievement is not because we are invading others or we are expanding our territories, but because we are working so hard under the leadership of Communist Party. And we pursued our reform and opening policy. And also, we always concentrate ourselves on economic development. So it's really a peaceful development and such a development makes the pie of development bigger. And the Chinese way to share with is to share the pie with the whole world and also invite more countries to participate in this process and to, to make the pie even bigger so that we can have a bigger share. So that is the way that China is dealing with the whole world. And I think there's no reason for us to change such a course because such a course is in the mutual interest of all the countries. And that leads to a win-win cooperation. We do not uh, expand or uh, we do not try to uh, grasp uh, uh, benefits by expanding uh, the uh, territory claims. And we do not agree with the uh, way that the original uh, powers, the old powers in the history, that they use worship policy and uh, expand and also invade others to grasp interests from other countries. And we also firmly oppose any kind of hegemonism and the power politics in the world. We believe that uh, a country, no matter how strong it is, it should be equal to others and treat others with respect and seek for common grounds with each other and try to build up a community, international community with shared future. So that is our strong belief in our foreign policy. And you can see that kind of policy is consistent, is clear, is continuous. No matter who is, uh, no matter uh, how the international situation is changing, China's basic foreign policy has not changed. And those policy like the five principles of peaceful coexistence, like the win-win cooperation, or like peaceful co uh, development, are all part of our foreign policy. And we will, we will see no reason to change it. So I hope that these words can also uh, uh, help you to understand that China would like to seek for a new path of development rather than those paths in the past have been explored by those, uh, say, colonialists or imperialists. China would like to seek for a new path of development, a peaceful way for us and for the world. Thank you. Thank you, Ambassador. Uh, we have really run out of time, but with your permission, I will accommodate two more questions. Uh, Professor Ronging of CIS Peqing and Mr. Ravi Bhutlingam of ICS. Uh, uh, is that all right? Yeah, please, please. Okay. Thank you, thank you. Uh, thank Professor you. Ronging? Professor Ronging is Vice President of China Institute of International Studies, Peqing. Uh, 
thank you very much. Uh, can, can you hear me? Ah, uh, yeah, we can hear you. We can't yes, see you though. Thank you very much. <laughs> no problem. <laughs> yeah, thank you very much. Uh, thank you, and uh, particularly I think it's the two ambassadors, Ambassador uh, Kanta and Ambassador Sun for the uh, uh, the uh, occasion. I think the a lot of uh, Indian colleagues, friends, have raised good many good questions that would help us to understand the the complexities and also the importance of the relationship. My question actually has been very simple. I, some of them have been touched upon Ambassador Sun. I said, if you look back the past 70 years of our diplomatic relations, for you, what would be the most important lessons we should have learned and how they could be used uh, to guide the future of our relationship? And related to that, I noticed that there are huge sort of gap of sort of perceptions and expectations of the relationship from the two sides. So how we can manage, with our, manage them with our joint efforts. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Professor Rongyi. Uh, well, I, I can't see you, but uh, I hope that uh, uh, maybe in the future we can also have another webinar that you can have a chance to uh, uh, share us with your uh, opinions. But uh, thank you for the uh, questions. Well, I think, yes, uh, the, at the uh, 70th anniversary of China-India uh, diplomatic relations, we can draw a lot of uh, lessons and experiences from our history. And I think history will always be a good teacher for all of us. Um, for me, I understand that uh, uh, there's a key uh, of, uh, uh, develop of the development of China-India relations, that is the lead, the leading role or the guiding guidance of the uh, two leaders, the leaders, that we, because in the, in the past decades, our leaders from the two countries have always given us the uh, general trend and the direction of our bilateral relations at the level of uh, strat uh, strat strategic and uh, overall picture. So their roles the leaders' roles are in, unreplaceable. And uh, in the future, we must also uh, reinforce and reiterate those uh, consensus that reached by the leaders and let those guidance to give us uh, uh, momentum for moving for, further ahead for the bilateral relations. Secondly, is that we must always put China-India friendly cooperation as a general trend in our mind. That we have a history of cooperation for more than 2000 years. And uh, that is the, the, the key, uh, the tomb for the China-India relations. And I don't think that this has been changed because during my remarks, I, I said that there are three unchanges. And the first unchanged is that China and India are still the largest developing countries and new emerging economies. I don't think this will be changed in the next decades. And it will be a long run for us to fulfill our dreams together. So if this is not changed, the basic condition has not changed. And cooperation and coordination is, are the best choice for China and India to work together. And thirdly, I believe that there are great potential and space for us to cooperate. Name some of them is like a pharma, ph a pharmacy pharmaceutical uh, industry, uh, the uh, uh, information technology, uh, connectivity, infrastructure, environmental protection, and even uh, poverty alleviation. So you can see that uh, China now is working very hard to eliminate absolute poverty in China within this year. And uh, we would like also to share those uh, experiences um, with the Indian side 
because both of us have huge populations that should uh, their living standards should be raised. So I think that uh, the potential is huge and that should not be affected by the recent difficulties or differences. And thirdly, and fourthly is that uh, we have a close coordination uh, in the regional and international affairs. We are all members of uh, BRICS and uh, SCO and G20, and we also have China, Russia, India cooperation. So we have all the reasons and duties and responsibilities to uh, safeguard the common interests of the developing countries. And China and India shares so much uh, common grounds on climate change, uh, uh, energy and uh, food security, and also public health, especially after this uh, pandemic. So I think China and India should also strengthen our coordination in the international arenas. And the uh, last but not least uh, is that we must properly manage our differences. Yes, we have difficulties and issues left over by history, like the boundary question. But the two sides must work together to keep dialogue with each other and have consultations to seek for a solution. Um, when I arrived here last year, I also mentioned that there are four key words to further promote China-India relations. First is guidance, the second is transmit, and the third is uh, shaping, and the fourth is integrate. So the guidance, of course, is by the leaders, and we should follow their guidance sincerely. But I think more importantly is that their consensus must be transmitted and implemented at different levels and uh, that could also go lead to the uh, grassroots people so that these, uh, uh, these consensus can be transmitted to real substantial cooperation outcomes. And also we must go beyond the mode of uh, different management and try to proactively shape our bilateral relations to add more positive energy into it. And also by uh, more closer cooperation, we should have more interest uh, integrated with each other so that we can achieve common development. So that's my idea that we can share with you for the future development of our bilateral relations. Oh, I'm, I'm sorry, I can't hear you, Ambassador Kant. Am I audible now? Yes, yes. Yeah, okay. The last question will be by Mr. Ravi Bhutlingam of ICS. Uh, yes. um, Thank you, uh, Ambassador Sun, for your presentation. Uh, my question is very brief. You said that the need of the hour is trust and not suspicion. Quite true. But we also know that the shocking incidents at Galwan have created within the Indian public less trust and more suspicion about China. Now, of course, we should implement the leader's guidance, as you said, but that needs to be implemented with some very concrete, visible steps that the Indian people can touch, feel, and see, and say, yes, now we can see that China is serious on rebuilding trust. So what would be these actual concrete steps in any area that you think will start this process of rebuilding trust? Hmm. Uh, thank you very much for this question. Uh, well, I think uh, originally the uh, 
China India uh, government is uh, planning uh, a series of activities to celebrate the 70th anniversary of China India uh, diplomatic ties. And uh, because of the uh, pandemic, that uh, some of the uh, activities cannot be implemented right now. But I think that uh, the proposals that made by the Chinese side to further strengthen our cooperation is still there. For example, last year when the two leaders met in Bahamani Puran, uh, they agreed that uh, China and India should uh, uh, discuss to, to establish a uh, uh, high level trade and investment dialogue mechanism between the two sides so as to strengthen our cooperation in the economic and trade area. And also, we seek the uh, possibility for uh, establish a, a manufacturer partnership between the two countries. I think these are also in line with uh, India's uh, uh, hope of uh, making India. And uh, that will also help China, Chinese uh, entrepreneurs to uh, participate in such uh, development. So I think these can also be discussed. Another very important thing is that we are facing this challenge of uh, COVID-19. And uh, I think the cooperation in the uh, anti-pandemic uh, field can also be discussed. Uh, I think we can share our experiences uh, for tackling such challenges. And also um, in the future, we, uh, when we are also developing uh, the vaccines and others, we should also uh, have more explore uh, exploring the, the possibility of uh, cooperation in those areas and uh, um, I think in the in, in international arena that China and India should also work together uh, for the international uh, public health cooperation uh, that we we have already had the G20 leaders summit and in the future China, India, as the two biggest developing countries, should also uh, further promote international uh, public health cooperation with each other to build a public health uh, community of shared uh, future. And uh, I think there are so many um, uh, fields that we can explore. Uh, but on the other side, that we must also strengthen our cooperation between the peoples. The people-to-people -people contact is perhaps the basis for the bilateral relations. And uh, we do hope that more and more Chinese and uh, Indian friends can uh, contact with each other and share their views and also strengthen the basis of people-to-people uh, -people friendship. That will also help us to have a better understanding of each other and uh, will lay a solid foundation for further development of our bilateral relations. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ambassador. Uh, we still have a very large number of questions uh, in chat box. Uh, people have raised their hands, but we absolutely run out of time. So we'll have to conclude uh, this webinar. Uh, before doing so, let me thank Ambassador soon for his presentation, for sparing the time, for uh, uh, making a very valiant attempt to present the Chinese perspectives on various issues which are troubling us today. Uh, we understand that uh, in your uh, presentation, uh, you have taken optimistic uh, and uh, forward-looking view, but uh, there are concerns and anxieties uh, which have been amply reflected in various questions that you had to field this afternoon. In fact, there are many more questions in the chat box. Uh, I believe it has been a, a fruitful dialogue. Uh, we learned from you. And uh, I hope that uh, from uh, Indian participants also, you'll take back uh, certain uh, signals, certain message 
about uh, what is troubling india china relations today as someone uh, who has spent you know uh, uh, nearly 15 years of my you know diplomatic career uh, dealing with this relationship uh, i feel personally invested in india china relations and i can tell you as i mentioned in my initial remarks in my welcome remarks i'm troubled by state of the relationship today i cannot business as usual we need to look at uh, us issues the root causes of present predicament and try and find a way ahead uh, hopefully we'll be able to do that so let me once again thank ambassador sun and indeed thank all of you for participating this webinar uh, which has been a very productive and fruitful exercise thank you very much thank you i'm also willing to have more chances to communicate with uh, friends from all walks of life in india and I once again thank Ambassador Kant to give me this chance to uh, talk face to face to you. Uh, we hope that uh, one day when the uh, epidemic is over, we can also meet uh, personally and uh, have some uh, in-depth discussion on that. But believe me, I am uh, confident that uh, the future of China-India relations is uh, still have a big space and a brighter future. Thank you, Thank you very, much. very much. We'll continue this dialogue. Thank you very much for joining us. Thank you.